Welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House US to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode 299 with Dr. Mark Epstein and Robert Thurman. And I thought tonight I was going to what you might enjoy, I thought, was uh, something on this Satipatthana, you know. Mm. Uh, how many of you have done mindf mindfulness meditations sort of regularly? And look, lots of you, yes, wait, how many? Some, and how many are brand new about it? Brand, brand new. <laughs> oh, that's good, that's good. And uh, it's kind of a craze, you know, nowadays. There's like Tell mindfulness teachers, and now they're all doing... The ones who do it, they're all doing teacher training. Yeah. So they're competing with the yogis. So I have a son who's an actor, and, uh, but he, he's a yoga teacher also. He's a certified yoga teacher. And, um, but he says that it used to be here in New York that all unemployed actors were waiters or waitresses in restaurants. And now they're all yoga teachers. So I'm, I'm, really, I'm really happy that now... <laughs> With all this teacher training going on, that now there can be a, you know, can be the option of mindfulness. That, it's coming. It is. It is. It's like, Tell them what this what Satipatthana is, because people won't know. The yeah. Word. Well. Okay. So, I could talk about the sutra we chanted, but oh, how many of you who are here tonight are coming tomorrow? Can you hold up your hands? Uh, not so many. Okay. So okay. So, um, well, the 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 heart sutra. Just briefly, before I go to the Satipatthana. Satipatthana is Pali language for Smriti Upastana, which is the Sanskrit. And the Smriti, or Sat, means memory. Yeah. This is very critical for psychoanalysis, I think, that it's actually, the meaning of the word is to remember, or remembering. And uh, also, Patana, I'm sorry, I have to quibble, because I'm a translator. The foundation translation is really it's not no good. good. I it's know. terrible. Yeah. Upastana, or, or patana in yeah. Pali, but upastana means to closely place. So it means to focus on something. So it isn't stand on something, it's to focus on it. So there's a four foci of mindfulness, actually, is what it is, although people tell me you can't say that. I, w I was battered in my youth in an English sort of oriented school where I had to learn Latin in the third grade. So I will tend to say foci. But people tell me you shouldn't use Latin plurals in English. You have to say focuses. Really? That's what I was told by editors. But maybe not. Oh, you all are probably overeducated too, so it's <laughs> probably all right to say foci. But anyway, they're the four foci of memory. And then it seems strange you use memory to remember something that's right here in the present. And then what I was thinking when you were talking about the mom coming or not coming, yeah. you know, et cetera. And uh, I was just trying to think about my experience. You know, <laughs> my mother also was an actress. Mm -hmm. And uh, when she had a part, she didn't come in the evening. So I, I would stay up as late as I was, actually, <laughs> which I was rather good. And then when she didn't have a part, she would come and help put me to bed a little bit. But I had governesses and different people like that, you know. And um, they didn't, they weren't rigidly by the clock, well, luckily, you know, probably I, I didn't get enough sleep. But uh, my companion was, I had an uh, imaginary lion under my bed called Richard, uh, Richard, which I used to pronounce Richard, Richard. I was told. Well, it was imaginary? It wasn't a stuffed animal? No, there was no, no, no I, well, I might have had some dolls. Or Not really, I think it was imaginary. Because uh -huh. he really was there, because he would jump out and growl at any kind of thing that would bother me in oh. bed. <laughs> And then he occasionally demanded, when my mother was there, mm. I would go and demand milk and cookies for Richard. Because mm -hmm. yeah. he needed them. Mm -hmm. 
to keep to be happy. You know? mm -hmm. So I was thinking about that, and then in the mindfulness thing, in relation to remembering those things and finding sort of the undercurrents and the embedded reactions mm -hmm. that are you don't know where they're from later when you grow up. That in a way, the smrti, taking memory and and focus, bringing it into the present and remembering where you are now, all the all the components of it that you usually ignore, like remembering that you have a back. And then what's wrong with your back? So, you know, I love Wilhelm Reich, as you know. I'm mm -hmm. really, really fond of I don't consider... He was so cool through the 40s, I think. I rode on a motorcycle there, but he had gone already, you know. Really? So in, in Maine? In Maine, yeah. In Maine. But I did, we didn't find... I went with some friends, and we didn't find the Orgone Buster, the Cloud Buster that he had, mm -hmm. which he used to shoot down spaceships, mm -hmm. you know, like aliens. In his old age, he went a little wacky, of course. He was persecuted by fascists and communists and all kinds of, and, and McCarthy. And, the FBI, and McCarthy. Yeah. You know, the McCarthy at uh, Americans in the 50s. So, and yeah. he had this well, brilliant, brilliant theory that fascism would never be gotten rid of in the planet in some form or another until the sort of inner psychological armoring was uh, of people. They weren't shut off from their own sense of themselves. You know? Yeah. He, he did. That was he. He, he actually That's... bluntly stated that after being beaten down by different fascist organizations and life, you know, fascistic organizations. So um, anyway, I was thinking. So the smrti upasthana. So the focus of memory, you know, which we we call mindfulness, which may not be the best translation. You know, you could say we say mindful awareness or wakefulness or something like that, and. Um, uh, the four foci, and then the first is the body. You know, Buddhists like to go and walk around these monuments, which remind them of the presence of the Buddha. Uh, the, the, the stupa, as it's called, a kind of certain shaped thing, is uh, and some of them huge, like towers, but they're solid. They're like funerary things almost, but they are said to represent the mind of the Buddha. So you have the sense that the, the subliminal message in those societies is that the Buddha is still present. His mind is still present, even though in that kind of Theravada society, they think Buddha left town like a Lone Ranger after having done something, which they lament, you know. Unlike some other Buddhist societies where they feel Buddha is still here, like in Mahayana, they feel the Buddha, the mind of Buddha, because the mind never is existing anywhere without a body. But the Buddha has a weird body, which is everything. <laughs> so poor Buddha has to stay here worrying about everybody and talk about the good enough mother. And a, a Buddha, your divine, Buddhahood is defined as becoming the good enough mother of every sentient being, which is really quite preposterous in one way, and in one way, if possible, quite extraordinary. So, okay, so, so I was reading this Mahasatipatthana Sutta, that is the great discourse on the foci of mindfulness, and uh, as we are translating, or memory, remembering. And um, um, because I was in a Theravada country, so I wanted to do that, you know. And also, there's a lot of complaint from Buddhists about the mindfulness craze, that they're not really doing the remembering properly, you know. They're just like, relax, you know, do a body scan and relax, and uh, breathe a little bit, and uh, calm yourself down. And like, sort of, don't distract, don't, don't, don't pay attention to your distracting thoughts and come back to this breathing. And if you just keep breathing, but you breathe while remembering that you're breathing, then you won't worry about it. You'll diminish your focus on worry, worrying about things, you know, which is really too simplistic, you know. And so I thought I, was, I would look at the source, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a more careful way. I had read so it then, before. So this sutra comes from the Theravada tradition, so not from, not Tibetan. Well, no, it's like, in all the traditions. Yes, actually. but it, the one you're... But this to. version of it is. But it's not just, Thera, it's not just Theravada. Okay, There's sorry. a difference between the Theravada tradition and the Mahayana tradition, which is really my, my own tradition, um, sort of. Uh, or, I mean, I'm an aspirant to have something to do with it. But... Um, one is called, you can call one dualistic. Formally speaking, one would call itself dualistic, and one would call itself non-dualistic. And the dualistic one is what people mostly understand Buddhism is about, because in the English-speaking world, the British and Sri Lanka, the Theravada, was the first notion of Buddhism that they learned about. They didn't really know who Buddha was. The Indian people had forgotten who it was. You know, the British were in India. 
And uh, then some weird thing was going on in China, but they didn't use the word Buddha. So they thought it was some, so that's what they really think Buddhism is. And what that dualistic means, that relief from suffering, you know, release from suffering, liberation from suffering, is in some other place. So nirvana or nibbana, as they call it, is elsewhere from the world of differentiated beings who all suffer. And so the whole idea that, like the poor Pope um, Benedict, and um, he frightened poor Pope John Paul, when, because he was John Paul's inquisitor. He was John Paul's um, head of the Office of the Doctrine of the Faith, which is the Inquisition, a new name for the Inquisition. <laughs> And he wrote that book, the uh, hope of uh, something of faith, hope of faith, or something faith and hope. Anyway, he, he had a chapter on other religions, and then the, he expressed in the in the voice of the Pope how sad it was to be a Buddhist. How he couldn't understand how people could just accept being miserable all the time, since those folks in the Vatican were so jolly. <laughs> uh, and how could people? How could people accept? Uh, a religion, as he thought it was, where what you accept is that suffering is inevitable and you just have to suffer, because everything is suffering. Because that's how people morally understand Buddhism. And then there's this place that is somewhere else that you can be free of it. But as long as you're here, you're going to suffer. So Mahayana doesn't agree with that. Mahayana says, right here is the land of bliss. This is nirvana. Right here and now is nirvana because nirvana is not created, it's the reality of here and now. So if you understand, the, if you overcome the ignorance that makes you suffer, or the misknowledge, the misunderstanding of you, what you are and what the world is, that you then will, when you really know its reality, then you will be blissful, and yet still here. So that's a, which is a huge difference, actually. Really, really huge. And of course I find that in the Satipatthana. So, and that's, that's what I thought you'd enjoy, and I'm, I'm gonna, I'll tell you a little bit about that. But now, the other thing I should say is that any sutra in Buddhist uh, literature, what they call sutra, it's a little different from what sutra means in, in Hinduism. Sutra means a discourse of the Buddha, usually. So, although in the case of the Heart Sutra we chanted, it's a, this, this Bodhisattva, who's actually a Buddha, but he's pretending just to be a Bodhisattva. He's a celestial bodhisattva, because bodhisattva means being more like other people, so they won't think he's some remote thing, you know. And um, he's considered the com universal compassion of all Buddhas. And so in that sutra, the Buddha just goes into meditation and he lets Avalokiteshvara talk. But he's in a meditation on the illumination of the profound, so that means he creates a field of people being aware of being mindful or remembering the reality of what is here, and then he discourses on what the reality is. But, but I'm, the reason I'm saying this is that, therefore, sutra is a guided meditation. It's where, so in the Satipatthana, the Buddha speaking to the mendicants, they're not monks, because like, that has a Christian connotation, they're mendicants. They're dropouts, and mendicant means that they live on free food. They're sympathetic to the wealthy Indian society, Asian society of those days, in that they only ask for lunch. But, and they get it's brunch, actually, because it has to be eaten, <laughs> eaten before noon. And then they don't eat any other food, don't ask for dinner, they don't ask for breakfast, just brunch. And um, so they don't, don't overstrain the, the people who are cooking the food. You know? And um, so that means mendicant. You know, which is, and they're, quite, they're not like monks, like, they're not unhappy, they're not serious, they're cheerful. The, being a mendicant in a Buddhist society is like, whoopee, it's like a MacArthur grant, lifelong. <laughs> It's not a handsome one, it's not hundreds of thousands of dollars, but it's free food and free space, no taxes, no family duty, no babysitting, uh, no, uh, no, tax, no, no military service if you're male, and if you're female, no service of your mother-in-law or, hus or husband, which, uh, which the early mendicant, female mendicants were very happy to get away from their husbands, actually. And many of them tell poems about how, oh, Buddha, I'm so happy you have me escape from my kitchen, my bowl, my bent over mother-in-law, three crooked things. My pestle that I used to have to pound the rice to husk it, crooked pestle, my bent over mother-in-law, and my hunchback husband. Thank you, Buddha. She says, if this is not nirvana, it's good enough. <laughs> you have poems like that. 
from the early period. <laughs> so, so anyway, so the focus of mindfulness, and, and, but what I was thinking psychoanalytically is precisely that Joseph's fear, yeah. when you wouldn't stop crying, you know, your, whatever it was about you, your right. worry about your PhD, or right. whatever it was, or, or your, the wiggle worm, whatever. <laughs> you know, the point is they are right here in the present. And anyone that's distorted, if you remember it in the present, because that's, it is here. It's not somewhere inaccessible. It's here. And if you put your mind on everything that is here, we will find everything that ever happened to us. And actually, of course, in Buddhist sense, we'll find all many previous lives yeah. that happened to us as well. When we get really more advanced in being able to remember really everything that's here. To, to, and then the other second big difference with Buddhism and, and the modern psychoanalytic theories is that, uh, that uh, Buddha definitely preceded Freud by discovering that there's a huge unconscious, mm -hmm. you know, and that the conscious mind is tip of the iceberg. You know? But the difference between him and Freud is that he was not just trying to find any excessive repression there and kind of vent it or soothe it, or, you know, and then leave it unconscious and realize that that's the case. I, does Freud have a thing in one of his papers about you, the donkey or something, you don't want to beat it to death, or you, want, you have to learn to ride it, but you can't really control it, but you make the, some kind of, like a pack animal or something, mm -hmm. which is the, as a metaphor for the unconscious drives, you know. Whereas for the Buddha, you have to become conscious of your unconscious. That's the human opportunity, and it's the human responsibility. And the reason that the, for the difference, I bet Freud would have gone further about it, mm -hmm. pushing it more, but the reason for the difference is that your unconscious goes with you into your next life, from mm -hmm. the Buddha's point of view. And in a way, therefore, you get driven by your drives, your unexamined mm -hmm. drives, into embodiments that you might not want. And so when you're conscious as a human being, you must use those times of consciousness to become rem remember, to become mindful of everything that in, your, in yourself, which you can do. And you can find not only conscious craving and hatred, and, but you can find eros and thanatos and face them down and, and you know, turn their energies uh, you know, to, into vehicles in a certain way without being driven into expressing mm -hmm. them or being destroyed by them, which mm -hmm. they will destroy you mm -hmm. otherwise, according to them. So even though only a few, so only, that's why people, when they, they sort of got that hint from Buddha, they would drop out from anything else in life. And, and they were lucky to be in a wealthy enough society compared to West Asia or China or Persia. But people don't realize that they have the idea that the Indus, uh, Indian, Indic countries, Indic subcontinent is all poverty stricken, but it was by far the richer part of Eurasia. And it has got the Garden of Eden, is the Indus Valley, you know, five rivers of Indus Valley, Ganges, Narmada, all of them. They were much richer than uh, people in other parts of Eurasia. So therefore they had a free brunch for everybody, land of the free lunch or free brunch. And you could be a mendicant and on lifelong scholarship, but which required learning and self-remembering. Anyway, so here he, he begins. So in other words, in, when I read this, and tomorrow we're gonna to work on actually doing mindfulness more, and I am, we're gonna read it in a sense of trying to practice it as we go along. But here's what he says. He says um, he was staying somewhere, they always say where, in a town, and then outside of the town actually is where they always stayed, four stone throws outside of town. They would never go far in the forest because you couldn't get brunch in the forest. And they weren't into self-torture like some sadhus. And you didn't want to live in town because it's too distracting. So four stone throws where you could go in for brunch. And then you would move from town to town so you wouldn't overstrain a particular town, you know, the, the economy of a particular town. So they were there and he addressed the mendicants and he said, mendicants. You know, I retranslated this changing of the terms mm -hmm. myself. I it's copy good. it. You know, Microsoft Word, mm -hmm. PDF, mm -hmm. you put it in there. It's a translator's dream. Mm -hmm. Then you substitute the words <laughs> for the proper words. So, uh, blessed one, they say. And, they, and oh, I didn't change blessed Lord, mm -hmm. which I'm sorry about. My son doesn't like translating Bhagavan as Lord. He says, we're importing like a European medieval feudal term in there, like the landlord, mm -hmm. like C-I-L, my landlord, we're putting that on Buddha. Mm -hmm. Bhagavan, what they call Buddha, means the lucky one, mm -hmm. the fortunate one. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean a lord, you know. Mm -hmm. 
like something above everybody. Mm. But, so, but anyway, that's what people in the West translated. So blessed one, I'll just say. So he addressed the mendicant. And blessed one, they said, and the, they replied. And the blessed one said, there is mendicants. This one way, and that's what they say up in Barrio all the time. Mm. This is the only way. Yeah. This one way to the purification of beings, for the overcoming of sorrow and distress, for the disappearance of pain and sadness, for the gaining of the realistic path, for the realization of nibbana. That nibbana means blowing, being blown away, just like it doesn't mean being destroyed or, or killing yourself, becoming nothing or something. It means being blown away. Like when you go to a concert, in this crowd, I would say probably Mozart at the Met rather than rock and roll. <laughs> but but uh, when you, if it was really good, you might say to someone in the younger generation, oh, I was blown away mm-hmm. by the symphony or whatever. You know, I, I just lifted out of myself. So that's what nirvana means. It does, and it doesn't mean you're, that people get killed or they destroy themselves. It just means their sorrow and pain and sadness and distress is blown away, nirvana. Like that. Hipster, hipster language translates ancient Sanskrit quite well sometimes. <laughs> no, really, like that, those man, that mantra that we chanted, mm. gate, gate, paragate, parasamgate, gate means gone. So what that means is gone, gone, super gone, super totally gone, mm. enlightenment, all hail. You know? So, you know, don't they say, in the jazz, uh, New Orleans, mm-hmm. they say, well, how was it? Really gone, man. Mm-hmm. Don't they say that? Mm-hmm. I'm not really a jazz fiend, but <laughs> they do say that. So then he says, what are the four focuses of mindfulness, foci of mindfulness? Here, mendicants, a mendicant abides contemplating body as body, ardent, clearly aware, and mindful. Having put aside hankering and fretting for the world, he or she abides contemplating Sensations and sensations, I didn't change feelings. The feelings is really wrong too, I'm mm. sorry. Because it is only pleasure, pain, and neutral. Yeah. It's not the emotional reaction. Right. It's, and and the, I know why they do it though, I figured it out. Mm-hmm. The reason they do it is that in, in our psychology, we don't allow there to be a mental sense, mm-hmm. like a sense. visual sense. Mm-hmm. Because we don't think there's a separate organ that's a mental organ. Mm-hmm. And actually, the, of course, what's in Buddhist psychology, what the mental organ is, is rather complicated. It has to do with time rather than, than some physical object like this, the neurons, you know, in the eye or in the, in the, in the nose or in the tongue, you know. So it's not, phys- it's, it's, it's not quite physical in, this, in a coarse way, let's say, in an atomic way. But anyway, so they call it feelings because they can't, in English they feel, well, how could you have just pure pain in the mind, mm-hmm. you know, or p- pleasure in the mind that wouldn't be emotional. But you do, actually according to them. You know? So that's why they, I think the British ancient times said feelings and all the Theravada people are stuck on that. Mm. But it should really be sensations. Mm-hmm. You know? So mind as mind. So uh, contemplating sensations as sensations, ardent, clearly aware and mindful or remembering, having put aside hankering and fretting for the world. She abides contemplating mind as mind Ardent, clearly aware, and mindful, having put aside hankering and fretting for the world. Hankering and fretting is an old-fashioned way of saying attraction and aversion, you know, like desire or hate, or, or hate, you know, lust or hate, eros or thanatos, that is. So putting aside those. And she abides contemplating mind objects as mind objects, ardent, clearly aware, and mindful, having put aside hankering and fretting for the world. So those are the four foci. So the first way you start, which is so interesting, is you just remember your body. And that's where in the popular mindfulness, this whole concept of the body scan comes in. Because when you meditate like this, now let's meditate now, just taste it for a few minutes. Okay, go into meditative mode, which is sitting in a chair means put your hands together and cross your ankle and try to sit up straight and let your eyes be half closed is the ideal and uh, breathe through the nostrils if you can, sort of peace, peacefully, you know. And, um, but you're thinking now about the body. And focusing on the breath is just one aspect of the body, the breathing function, the lungs, you know, the nostrils, you know, the sensation of the air coming into the nostrils, and so on. Uh, but uh, basically focusing on the body as body means 
thinking around feeling all parts of your body. Sense, where are the sensations? Like when you, right now you sit, contemplate your body. And the way you do it is, what, where do you feel your body? Like I feel my feet on the floor, and that, but that's only the balls of my feet, maybe the toes. If your feet are flat on the floor, you'll feel it down, down the, the outside of your arch and then your heel. And you feel where you have contact with the floor. Otherwise, to feel the arch of your foot, you don't have anything touching it and it's, it's sort of neutral. So you don't feel it at all. So you only can imagine your picture in your mind of having a foot, sort of from being inside it. And then you work up the calf and the muscles and the bones and the ligaments and the joints. And you go up through the body and you come to the, to the body and whatever your picture, inner picture is about the spine, the nerve paths, the blood system, the you know, circulatory system, the lymphatic system, and the intestine, colon, upper intestine, uh, then the pancreas and spleen and liver and raw bladder and lungs, the mother lung and the son lung, the heart, and then the, you know, the musculars and the back and the shoulder blades and the shoulders and the fingers. Are, so you really start feeling, and when you do that, you'll begin to realize that you, a lot of the time you don't sort of notice much of your body. As you said, Mark, your yoga teacher told you that you started dealing with your trapezius. <laughs> but if you're a doctor, I guess you had to study anatomy. So actually you can move your mind around within a more detailed picture of your innards and your outers. And, um, and really try to be aware of it. And then, and, and you sort of learn something, but what he, 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 the first thing he says, they, they, they do the breathing, they begin with the breathing, you know. And it's sort of boring, repeats it because it's very repetitive if you read it or you hear it read. And tomorrow I will read it in detail, but I'm not going to do that today because it's, it's sort of incantatory. It's like, I will breathe out, conscious of the whole body. I will breathe in, calming the whole body, a process. I will breathe out, calming the whole body. And then some, some similes about um, um, potter, how they shape, how they shape the pot that they shape as it's, or, or how Turner no means on a lathe, how you shape a piece of wood in a certain way. So you're shaping being in your body. So actually you're, you're working on your mental picture of your body, but it doesn't focus on that at the moment. And you're sort of trying to occupy your entire body. And in a way, when you do that meditatively, actually, if you think about it, you know, if you, if you connect it to Wilhelm Reich, that knots in your memory, traumatic of traumatic residues of traumatic experiences, are not only just in some neurons in your brain, but they involve certain cramps in the subtle neural cramps in your what he calls character armoring or neuromuscular emotional armoring in your body. So if you remember being, remember the body, you, you mindfully focus on being completely your body, you'll begin to find, uh, you'll, some parts will be knotted off from your awareness actually, where you can't, feel, you don't feel them, you don't sense them, but you're not focusing on that right away, you're just working on the body. And the breathing is the easiest thing to start in the middle of it, but it's not at all, it's just the beginning. And then you do mindfulness, you remember that there is a body, it's present, or the, or the, 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 remem remem the memory that there is body is present to him just to the extent necessary for knowledge and awareness. And, and he abides, the mendicant, but he's talking to a bunch of mendicants, so he's using the third person. But you could put it as you abide, independent, not clinging to anything in the world. So you're really just content to be your body. And that mendicant is how a mendicant abides contemplating body as body. And then you move around. When you walk, you know you're walking. When you stand, you know you're standing. When you're sitting, you know you're sitting. When you lie down, you know you're lying down. In whatever way the body is disposed, you know that that's how it is. And so you abide contemplating body as body, internally, externally, and both internally and externally. And you abide independent, not clinging to anything in the world. And that mendicant says how 
a mendicant abides contemplating body as body. And then I'm going to skip a lot of stuff because, you know, then they go into a whole thing about what's the, it like to be in a body and actually to generate a sort of de-glamorization of the body. There's a very detailed, in this body there are head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, pleura, whatever they are, spleen, lungs, mesentery, bowels, stomach, excrement, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, tallow, saliva, snot, synovic fluid, urine. And on urine. Just as if there were a bag open at both ends full of various kinds of grain, such as heel rice, paddy, green gram, uh, green gram, kidney beans, sesame, husk rice, and a man with good eyesight were to open the bag and examine the bag, saying, oh, and all the grains in it, then would say, this is heel rice, this is paddy, this is green gram, this is kidney beans, this is sesame, this is husk rice. So too, a mendicant reviews that very body, in this body there are, etc. you know, wrong list. And then this gives, the more one does that, the more one, in a way, first occupying the entire body, and then second, becoming aware that the mind in the body is not the body, and gaining more freedom of the mind, because at the end of it, he keeps saying this thing about, you abide independent, not clinging to anything in the world. And that is how you do, you know, and independent and free and like carefree type of thing. So you're kind of bringing your mind to where you can really feel your mind almost separate from body, but the bridge to feeling the mind as if, as if it were in a way moving around in the body, therefore actually not the body in itself, is you go to sensations. So the bridge between body as object, as body, although experiencing yourself as a body is making it subjective kind of, is you focus on sensations. And then it's quite short, the whole thing of sensations. And so, you know, the awareness that, you know, he says, you abide contemplating arising phenomena in your sensations, vanishing phenomena in your sensation, both arising and vanishing phenomena in your sensation, or else mindfulness simply that remembering simply that there are sensations is present to you just to the extent necessary for knowledge and awareness. And then you abide independent, not clinging to anything in the world. That is to say, you don't grab at your sensations and you don't shrink away from some negative one. You become sort of more balanced about them because you become independent and you don't cling to them. And that's how, how that mendicant is how a mendicant abides contemplating sensations and sensations. Then they, he does mind itself, and here he only goes down deep into, he says, here as a mendicant you know your lustful mind as lustful, your mind free from lust as free from lust, that is sort of craving some kind of more, if you have some pleasant sensations you crave more of them, and that is, is at the deepest level lustful. A hating mind is hating, a mind free from hate is free from hate. And there, your aversions to any painful thing, uh, you, uh, you, you, you don't cling on them, and therefore you free yourself from them by becoming aware of them. And then a deluded mind is deluded, and that, is, that focuses on the neutral sensations. In other words, you don't appropriate the neutral sensations as yours, and so an undiluted mind is undiluted. And then he adds a few things, a contracted mind is contracted, a distracted mind is distracted, a developed mind is developed, an undeveloped mind is undeveloped, a surpassed mind is surpassed, an unsurpassed mind is unsurpassed, a concentrated mind is concentrated, an unconcentrated mind is con unconcentrated, a liberated mind is liberated, an unliberated mind is unliberated. And so you abide contemplating mind as mind, internally, externally, contemplating arising things in the mind, vanishing things in the mind, both arising and vanishing things in the mind. Or else, finally, that you remember that there is mind is present, just to the extent necessary for knowledge and awareness, and you abide detached, not grasping at anything in the world. You're just, you're the mind, you're the mind, and you don't have to grasp, you don't have to love, you don't have to crave, you don't have to, to hate, you don't have to be lustful, you don't have to be aversive. And that mendicant is how a mendicant abides contemplating mind as mind. Then he comes to the big category, which goes on and on and on, mind objects, or really they are things. 
And at this point you realize that your awareness of your own body is actually, except unless you're looking at some one part of one of your limbs or something, or looking at your face in the mirror, you really are not aware of the whole content of the body. It's impossible. You, what you're aware of is a picture, which is an idea, an image of your body. And if you're a very detailed image, if you're, if you're a mendicant who has gone into detail, or a doctor who has dissected corpses or something, then you know how complex it is. And you have a very complicated picture. And so even a sensation, you locate it within that picture. And in a way, you're having a, a concept of a sensation. And even the fact of being a mind, you have a notion of a mind. So when you get into mind objects, you're going more deeply and you're beginning to realize how the content of your mind is where you spend your time. And they go very complicated. And then I, I'm skip, 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 because I want to show this one thing to Mark, which I love. And then, you know, they went through it all in the Heart Sutra. Remember it said, there are no, you know, sense media, no, con no I sense media, no consciousness sense media. I mean, I go through all these things. And this, this is where you, when you meditate on the mind in more detail, you break up your normal consciousness into six, a six-fold process, where sometimes it's aligned with your mental, your visual consciousness, sometimes aligned with your audio consciousness, sometimes aligned when you're smelling with olfactory, sometimes with gustatory, sometimes with tactile, you know, the, the things, and then sometimes just reacting to things in the mind. But the, the mental sense is often aligned with one of the other senses, which is why sometimes if you're very intensely looking, you don't hear something floating away in a concert, maybe you don't see anything, you know, we, because we pick out different ones to align ourselves with, even though data comes into all of the five senses all the time. <clears throat> so, so, then, so, but anyway, finally, the last bunch of mental objects, he says, when you're getting really more sophisticated about the incredible complexity of your mind, is the Four Noble Truths, which is Buddha's original diagnosis, his medical diagnosis of life. And the first one is the truth of suffering. And that he does in great detail, connecting it to craving or lust, actually. And how, and he goes in detail how you remember how you felt something pleasant and then you wanted more of it and then it sort of, it disappeared. So it, 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 uh, it changed into its opposite or it faded. And that annoyed you and you felt dissatisfied. So they call that kind of pleasure suffering of change because it doesn't last and they're very that's very important in the in overcoming attachment to 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 surface pleasure uh, this pleasure accompanied by craving is that the craving will crush the pleasure actually very quickly in, into to turn it into dissatisfaction and uh, the craving arises in agreeable and pleasurable phenomena mind objects in the world it's agreeable and pleasurable and there this craving arises and establishes itself and that is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. So then the source of the suffering he analyzes and you meditate on when you're in the fourth focus of mindfulness on how you're grasping at your sensations and the positive ones and pushing away the negative ones. That's the origin of the suffering and turning positive ones even into suffering. But, and, but then this is the one. And what mendicants is the noble truth of the cessation of suffering, the, the nirvanizing of suffering, the blowing away of suffering. It is the complete fading away and extinction of this craving. It's forsaking and abandonment, liberation from it, detachment from it. And how does this craving come to be abandoned? How does its cessation come about? In other words, where is the cessation of suffering? In other words, where is nirvana? He's saying, like, what is it? Where is it? You know, he's saying, you're, and this is the, he's leading them into meditating on that, the mendicants. Wherever in the world there is anything agreeable and pleasurable, there its cessation comes about. Mm. Not a, I don't like the translation fully because mm -hmm. there the cessation of suffering comes about. Mm -hmm. He doesn't mean the agreeable and the pleasurable ceases. Mm -hmm. He means the cessation comes mm -hmm. about. Because it is the craving of more agreeable and pleasurable that destroys agreeable and pleasurable. Mm -hmm. So the cessation 
It just says it's. So the the reference of the it's is bad in English mm. here because the person translating this is being dualistic mm -hmm. and thinking that nirvana means you extinguish your sensations. But this is, doesn't say that. Yeah. He says where you. So what is the difference, in other words, between pleasurable sensation, including mental sensation, mm. and suffering sensation, which is the suffering of change? He clearly says it's where the craving crushes the sensation by grasping it and, and it then, you know, it's like you grasp the pleasure and then it disappears. And when did you ever have a great time in a concert or in any kind of experience, any kind of sensual or sensory experience, you're having a great time and then you thought, how great is this? <laughs> and when was it more great or how could it have been more great? You're instantly dissatisfied, you know? That's like when you, you, in the old days, you would sit up and have a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> but, but the point is, it's here. He, he doesn't say nirvana yeah. is when you have ceased and you're no longer breathing and you, know, and you leave the world. He doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. He says the cessation is wherever there is something agreeable and pleasurable. And there, the cessation of suffering, because it's the cessation of suffering that's revert to here. Mm -hmm. So the agreeable and pleasurable. So now, when, you, when, you, when you're blown away by pleasure and by agree the agreeable, you just flow, float away on it. It takes you away. It blows away your craving for more. That's when you're temporarily satisfied and you... Because you don't think, this is my pleasure, you know? It just wells up spontaneously from within mm. because you're no longer grasping. And so when the cessation, when the craving, the lust for more agreeable and pleasurable ceases, then the agreeable and the pleasure in itself is, you know, what is there in the world that is agreeable and pleasurable? He, because he then let, proves that my point. Because he said, well, what is it? The eye in the world is agreeable and pleasurable. The ear in the world means in, in relation to its objects. The ear is agreeable and pleasurable. The nose, the tongue, the body, the mind in, the, in this world, that's what's agreeable. And there this craving comes to be abandoned, and there its cessation, the cessation of suffering comes about. And then eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue, the body, mind consciousness in the world is agreeable and pleasurable. And there this craving comes to be abandoned and the cessation of the craving comes about. And sounds, smells, tastes, tangibles, mind, objects in the world are agreeable. There this craving comes to be abandoned, there the cessation comes about. He goes on all the long list of all these complex things that when you become a true mindful aware and you, and you truly remember the field of your existence in life right now in all of its detail, and you realize that when left alone by either grabbing or pushing away, it's fine. Mm -hmm. And that's where nirvana is. Mm -hmm. So that's the non-duality of mm -hmm. nirvana and samsara. The, mi <clears throat> the mind that does not cling. Yeah. That is, uh, is the freedom. Well, the mind lets itself go. Mm -hmm. In a way, it, there's no attainment of a mind that doesn't cling, but there's no non-attainment mm -hmm. because the mind without craving and aversion doesn't cling, actually. No. The mind is present and everything is just a revelation. And, in, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a, the, inner, the inner bliss, that's a noble truth, noble reality. When truth there means reality, it doesn't mean a proposition. The reality of the cessation of suffering and then the noble truth of the way. So that, that's, that's a revolutionary grounding of the non-duality of, you know, Nagarjuna's famous statement or the Prajnaparamita's famous statement that, you know, gone, gone, gone is the suffering, mm -hmm. super totally gone, mm -hmm. and all hail enlightenment right mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. you know. You know, and then I'm going to do something really dairy. Now, now your wonderful book that, that I thought, isn't that, that's kind of a backbone of, of tomorrow? A little sure, bit. Sure, it could be. It's your current backbone. You didn't write yeah. another one. No. no. <laughs> right. You know, it's sort of your message, your kind mm -hmm. of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Your stick with mm -hmm. it, with it, right? Mm -hmm. So you use the eightfold and the advice not given. Yeah. So you're kind of, I mean, of course, you don't want to make it your back home because you're a professional. 
but I'm pushing you to give the advice not given naturally, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you don't have to give it to everybody. Yeah. I, give it, some, I give it freely. I mean, you can give it freely, but a lot of people will not even hear it. A lot of, well, people, people hear what they- That's the great thing they, about secrets. That's right. They keep themselves. <laughs> you know, and in a way they're non dual like Buddha himself, he had advice not given for 400 years. What do you mean? I mean, he said in his, in his, to his Mahayana assemblies, he said, okay, you mendicants who hear this and some divine beings and bodhisattvas and weird creatures, you know, that show up when he gives teachings, supposedly in the Mahayana, he said, I'm teaching you this, but I don't want you to spread it about mm. in India. And around 400 years from now, someone with the Naga, word Naga in their name will show up, some mendicant, and they will, they will retrieve these the record of these teachings and they will then spread it about. But for 400 years, I don't want to spread it about because the dualistic one that you have to get out of life to be free is needed for those years to build up these continuous support in the society of people dropping out, of getting mm -hmm. educated, you know, because... Unfortunately, most spirituality in the world, even still today, is people becoming psychotic. That is to say, oneness with God by mystics in theistic systems, nirvana in dualistic Buddhist systems, you know, oneness with Krishna in Hindu systems, you know, the union with the Tao in Taoist systems, all of that people are fantasizing that they're going somewhere else mm -hmm. because they can't imagine that being entangled with everybody and everything could be blissful because everybody is such a pest and a bug <laughs> and their own body is a pest and a bug and about after 90, 100 years a minute they're ready to leave it call Jack Kevorkian and like, get me out of here <laughs> Because they, of course, they wrongly think they're going into nothingness, which shows the insanity of the materialist culture. Mm -hmm. To think that nothing is a place you can go to, ha ha. You know. But never mind on that. We won't belabor. I will belabor that, but not tonight. <laughs> I always do. So, so, so he he therefore kept the advice not given mm -hmm. that everything is fine right now. Mm -hmm. On to people for 400 years because the, because the true, the misunderstanding of the mm. non-duality of freedom from suffering and suffering is that oh well I can just have an idea that I'm free of suffering and go around and do anything cause any pain or harm or anything and I don't care you know it doesn't matter what I do you know so a kind of thing and then also kings who like to monopolize and terrorize their subjects and monopolize all their life's energies would say, well, it doesn't matter. You don't have to go be a mendicant and be fed by me free lunch. You don't need my free lunch. You can produce more wealth for me. You can conquer some countries for me. So non-duality can be wrongly misinterpreted as monism. Mm -hmm. Do you know, like the Brahminical monism where it's all one, so you're the untouchable, I'm the Brahmin, so clean my latrine, you know, mm -hmm. and you're still, that's God's work, mm -hmm. you know, and you don't have to think about becoming liberated. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to be because mm -hmm. I want someone to clean up for me, mm -hmm. type of thing. You know, mm -hmm. and men over women. You know? mm -hmm. So he that that can be misunderstood in that way. And so he left it 400 years to establish these beachheads for people to psychoanalyze themselves, mm -hmm. which is what the mendicants were doing. They were not belonging to a religion, really. They were rebelling against the religion of the time, which was the Vedist religion. They were seeking. They were educating themselves. To, just, to become mindful of the reality of their life. And I'm mindful of the reality of time. <laughs> and it is time. Okay. Should we stop? Mm -hmm. But isn't that fun? We just, I'm, I'm, I'm not coming up. Isn't it fun? It's in the pleasure. To see, I know, I love that. The extinction of the suffering is in the agreeable thing. Mm -hmm. If you don't grasp like that. Mm -hmm. So this, I have to elaborate a tiny bit. I'm sorry, my own stick. Since I know some of you aren't coming tomorrow. I just have to elaborate. So this key, this my key thing nowadays, which I meant to get into, but I didn't because I was enjoying conversation. But, but is that Buddha's discovery, is main discovery is nirvana, not suffering. Everybody knows about suffering. 
Just people define it different ways and react to it in different ways. Buddha discovered that there is truly possible ability of being really free of suffering and being really able to help others find their own freedom. Unfortunately, you can't force them to be free of suffering. You can't blast them with bliss or something. You have, they have to do it through their understanding. And, it, and that reality, and why is that possible, was his discovery. Because the reality of the world is blissful. We are very lucky beings. We live in a, not every being in the world, but our, our level of being in the world, you know. Being in a perfect world where there are plants radiating oxygen for us to breathe and absorbing our carbon if we don't give it too much, you know, and, and growing food, and etc. In other words, and other beings who, who are loving and we are loving of them and mothers who will accept us in a womb, in their wombs, you know, for free without even paying any rent. You know, that, that's a, that it's really, actually life is fabulous, is what Buddha discovered. That's why he was smiling. But when we misunderstand it, to think it's a struggle and it's us versus everybody else, you know, because it's ourself is the main thing and nobody else agrees that ourself is the main thing. Not a single one of you agree that Mark or I are the main thing in life. <laughs> And you're paranoid about yourself because you think you are the main thing and you know that nobody else agrees with you except the occasional lover for a while. And also the good enough mother for a while. Mom did think so and dad did think so at one point, right? But otherwise, and mammals do. You know, the mammal life is really fun too. Anyway, so, 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 you know, that's, that's, that's my thing. So I just have ran over time a little bit to underline the, the thing about the non-duality. Yes. Because, you know, he, he didn't give the advice for 400 years mm -hmm. because he, did, he didn't have a society like ours with a universal education for people of supposedly every caste, although, mm -hmm. of course, ours is imperfect, as we're noticing, with the, you know, the oligarchy and people cheating to get into Harvard. <laughs> but <laughs> nevertheless... We have this ideal, and we are, everyone is so, every, so educated, they can't stand it, and they don't want to learn anything more, and they think that meditating is going to solve their problems, because at least it's not more educating. <laughs> it's being trained, which is nonsense. It's part of it. It's a higher education. It's, it's more education, actually. It's, or it won't work if you don't learn more about it. So, okay, thank you so much for coming. Okay? All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so happy. Thank you, Bob. This podcast is produced under a Creative Commons No Derivatives license. Please feel free to share, like, and repost on your favorite social media platforms. And it's brought to you through the generosity of the Tibet House U.S. Menla membership community and listeners like you. To learn how to support this podcast by becoming a Tibet House U.S. Menla member, please visit our websites at thus.org, menla.org, and bobthurman.com. Interstitial music is weekly supplied by Tenzing Chogyal. To learn more about the work and music of Tenzing Chogyal, please visit his website at tenzingchogale.com. This episode was originally streamed live online from Tibet House U.S. March 2019 and is a part of the Tibet House U.S. Membership Archives. To learn more about the benefits of membership, please visit our websites. This has been Justin Stone Diaz, and I want to thank you for tuning in. Tasha Delek, and hope to see you online and in person soon.